So how many of you, after you took an Uber home last night, just looked, in yourself, looked at yourself in the mirror and were just disgusted with the kind of person you are? Wait, so no one here is a Guardian journalist then? Because these are real op-eds that I see in The Guardian. They talk about if you take Uber, you're contributing to this system that exploits workers, that, tear, that shows no respect for the rule of law, and it leads to a monopoly, all these litany of complaints against the sharing economy. And pretty much what I'm going to do over about the next 15 minutes is explain to you why everyone at The Guardian is wrong when it comes to the sharing economy and give you some of my thoughts on the future of work and really where this is going to lead us. So the first thing to point out is whenever you hear critics of the sharing economy, they only focus on Uber. They act as if this is the only company that follows the trends that are leading to the rise of the sharing economy. But this is completely wrong. I really look at it as back in the 1990s, there were all these internet companies. But you never hear that anymore because everything's an internet company. In the same way, I don't think 10 years from now we're going to have just these sharing economy companies. But rather, it's going to be just a part of our entire economy. So let me explain. The main trend that I see that leads to the rise of things like Uber, Airbnb, and the list goes on, is lower what economists refer to as transaction costs. So just think, as long as anyone's been on Earth, you've wanted a place to stay, you've wanted to get somewhere, you've wanted to find food, all these things were desires that people had, but it was simply too expensive to go around knocking on each door of flats in London, asking how much it would cost for you to stay there for a night, and trying to figure out if that host was someone who's reliable, who you can trust. But now with a few clicks of a mouse, you can find people who are willing to offer you a service, and you can figure out the cost, and you can figure out how reliable they are. So really what the sharing economy does is empowers consumers by giving us more access to information. Again, because transaction costs are lower. It hardly takes any time now to vet people. But you have people in government consistently viewing these companies as unregulated. I know in the US, uh, Bernie Sanders, he says he has serious problems with Uber, and he actually just told Bloomberg, I'm not a fan of Uber, you can quote me on that. So I try to do it whenever I can. But what he, uh, what he argues is that these companies are completely unregulated. Well, that's just a lie. But secondly, the only type of regulation that people like Bernie Sanders view is government regulation. But what happens with these peer-to-peer -peer systems is you can now hold companies liable. And you really have a reputational-based system. And this, I would argue, is more powerful than even some sorts of government regulation. I mean, when you're all going out to eat, do you go to the government website to check the regulators' reports on the restaurants? No, you go to Yelp or Google reviews. But regulators consistently act as if all these services don't exist. They're stuck in the old economy, when consumers had no information or little information, and you needed, I guess there was an argument for larger government intervention now. So consumers are empowered. I mean, luckily, when the sharing economy first started and I was writing on Uber, people were honestly arguing that it was bad for consumers. Now that argument's gone behind. Again, even what I'll refer to as the Guardian critique of the sharing economy admits this much. But also, it empowers workers. And I think this is very important because this is the main debate right now. You kind of have people who are lining up against the sharing economy trying to bring back the 1950s workforce, where they want everyone to have a boss, Everyone to punch a time card, you know, when you work eight to four or nine to five. And also, they meet, they think that if you're not in a union, you're being exploited. So I don't know about you, but young people, especially in America, and I've seen polls that show the same here, that we simply don't want to work for the same company for 40 years, then retire with a pension plan. You want to do what you're passionate about. And because of the uh, technology that has led to the rise of the sharing economy, this is easier than ever before. It's really, like, sharing economy isn't the best term to use when talking about it, because you're not sharing resources, but you are sharing access to platforms. But I would call it even enabled entrepreneurship. It makes it easier than ever before for people to work for themselves. And polls consistently show about two-thirds of millennials want to start their own business at some point. And of course, the sharing economy, this isn't just going and working as an Uber driver or an Airbnb host, but everyone from personal trainers to chefs to accountants to graphic designers, 
all of these people can now more easily than ever before find customers and market their services. So it really does allow you to work for yourself a lot more when transaction costs are lower. And just a quick economics uh, fact here, the whole reason that firms existed is because it was too expensive to go out and let's say every time you needed something designed, if you wanted to make you know, the, the logo for the Think Conference, it would be too expensive to go out in the past and find someone who could do that for you just you know, on one job. So these firms grew very large by bringing everyone in-house and treating them as full employees. But now in the future, as I said, it's going to be easier than ever before for people to work for themselves and for people to find each other. But going on from the benefits from consumers and for workers, I think it's important to point out that these critics of the sharing economy also just want to, uh, like, I guess, keep an older business in business for the sake of just having it exist. I know Mayor Khan even wrote an op-ed on Uber where he said we should think about banning it or capping it because he doesn't want black cabs to go the way of the red phone booths. I mean, this is not how we should base government policy on just keeping something that he thinks is cute and he thinks that people should have when they go to London. Instead, policymakers need to embrace what uh, Adam Thayer at the Mercatus Center calls permissionless innovation. This is where, rather than going and asking for permission to build a business, you have some clearly defined rules and you can innovate within that. That's why we've seen so much growth in what Professor Cowan was just talking about in the technology sector. Because by and large, the internet was a place that was created really you know, somewhat tax-free and really regulation-free. There's a reason you don't see all this innovation happening in energy or in finance, because those industries are so regulated. But one thing that I am hopeless, uh, uh, hopeful about is even if policymakers don't follow my advice and allow these companies and innovative services to grow, thankfully, entrepreneurs are way smarter than regulators. Just think, if you're not good enough to get a job in an actual company, then you go and become a regulator. Or you could be like me, and instead of working in the sharing economy, you can talk about it. But one thing we've seen uh, consistently, I know John Tamney, who's a fellow at the Reason Foundation, he argues that whenever regulators do win, it's something like Iceland beating England. You know, it can happen, it's possible, but it's not going to happen a lot of times because entrepreneurs are so much smarter. The example I use in the US is the post office that we have. They still have a monopoly on delivering letters. But because of innovations such as FedEx and UPS and of course email, it's really nothing more than just the butt of jokes about government inefficiency. So the regulations are still there, but entrepreneurs were able to innovate around these regulations. So that's what we want to continue to push for. But we also saw it, this isn't exactly uh, something that's right or left on a political issue. We have people in the United States and here with Boris Johnson too saying that he wanted to cap Uber's growth because he said that it was breaking many laws. I mean, these politicians are coming out, frankly, because they want to protect the established interests and they don't understand why people want to work for themselves. They think again that you need a boss, you need to punch a time card, and you need to be in a union. And my favorite example of this is Hillary Clinton, who's probably going to be the next president of the United States. I looked back at her tax uh, filings, and since her and her husband left the White House, 99% of their income has come from working for themselves, from independent contractor work rather than employee work. Yet, she goes out and talks about Uber and says that these companies in the sharing economy are misclassifying their workers and taking advantage of them. Well, you know, great for her. She realizes the benefits of working for yourself, but we need to extend this to other people and allow them to take part in the entrepreneurial economy. So I think when we're talking about the sharing economy, the main things you need to keep in mind are, again, it's much larger. This isn't the case of people just going and becoming Uber drivers. It's really the trend we've seen over the last decade of more and more people working for themselves. And that's only going to continue as transaction costs continue to fall. And the other thing uh, to keep in mind is you don't have to feel bad about taking Uber because they also, opponents argue that it's unprogressive. It's just another example of all the income gains going to a few rich venture capitalists while workers are hung out to dry. But that's simply not the case. When you hear people talking about how it's exploiting workers or it's unprogressive, an important thing to keep in mind is actually that these services extend options to people who didn't have them before. 
Just think, a decade ago, how expensive would it be to hire a private driver? This is something that truly the only, only the top 1% could afford. But now all of us, and even when I was a student, I was able to afford Uber. They're bringing these luxuries to everyday people by creating innovative platforms. So I think there's a lot of misinformation going on on the sharing economy. There's now a big fight saying that it's terrible for workers. But again, there's two visions of the future. One is where work is flexible, individualized, and mobile. And really, services follow the same line, flexible, individualized, and mobile. But on the other hand, you have people who want to bring us back to the 1950s and make sure that all of you have a boss. And I don't know about you, but my dream job is not having a boss. So I think it's something that young people are increasingly becoming open to, is the idea that regulation is not there primarily to protect us, but to protect established interests. And speaking of the Reason Foundation again, they did a very interesting poll where they found that only 18% of millennials think that government policy, prim uh, when it comes to regulation, is primarily about protecting public safety. So people realize that regulations are more often than not coming in to protect something like the black cabs, like with what Khan wants to do. And we see this, I even call it the ubertarian effect, where millennials are libertarian when it comes to Uber, because when government regulation gets in between you and something you use every day, it's much more obvious than, let's say, the effect of energy regulation by the time you charge your cell phone. So I think young people in general, and one of the reasons I'm the most optimistic, is that I've also heard them called a uh, hipster capitalist, where I, I was trying to find a store wandering around London that I could use in an example, but I haven't had much time to do that yet. But I know in Brooklyn, there's a store that only sells pickles for about eight pounds a pickle. I mean, whatever millennial entrepreneur came up with this idea and saw this market need, good for them, because I definitely didn't see it. But we want to start our own businesses. We want to work for ourselves. And government uh, and policymakers are making a wrong decision when they think they can bring us back to the old model of the workforce. So the sharing economy, I think that term will disappear in 10 years. Again, it's going the way of the internet economy. It's going to take over pretty much everything. And the model Uber 4X, that won't work. It's not just you apply Uber to every sector, but the same trend of lower transaction costs, increased consumer empowerment, and increased uh, worker empowerment are going to be seen across the board. And I'm pretty excited for that. But also, I wanted to cut this a little bit short so we could have some more time for Q&A, because it's always interesting to hear what's going on over here or what your thoughts on the sharing economy are. And for a little bit, because I realize incentives matter as an economist, if you are one of the first five people to ask a question, you get a free copy of my mini book. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to continuing this discussion.